The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Here's Brandon. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Brandon Peter Show. Today features a discussion of the 1986 film The Wraith. Joining me from the PopCon International Film Festival, I have the director and programmer, Audrey Lane. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming on again. This is your what is your first appearance solo. Yes. You were yes, on the, the legendary Back to the Future episode, which I was so pleased with the results. That was a lot of fun. That oh was that was very different. And I was very happy to be a part of something so unique. so unique. It was it was a dream of mine, like for a long time. And it like happened better than I could have possibly. I got everybody I wanted to be on that show on that awesome. show. And then they were just even better than I imagined. <laughs> So that was we should do that once a month. Like I literally could get together once a month and and do that type of show. It's so much fun. I don't want to edit trailers for the <laughs> <laughs> I know that would be a lot of work for you, but it'd be really fun for me. I almost I almost love behind the scenes. I almost cut out the part where I said I was gonna do that because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is grueling. What if I just take it out? What if I just take it out? No one ever knows. I was promising but it a trailer. It was such a good segment, like to piece together. I mean, yeah. it seemed like such a a real trailer that was brilliant. It it was good. It was. Really it did. Good. I I pulled it off, but man, there were times because I spent like because I think people don't know, but like I record we recorded that like a month or a little longer before that episode dropped because it was in my because <laughs> it was in my original package to have of my launch my first four three to four weeks of the show. So I was getting things done very early to figure myself out and figure how the show was going to go. And (laughs) so, but anyway, like back then you were actually, you were with horror hound with the film festival and slowly entering PopCon. Now you're just, well, I was doing both simultaneously. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, because that was right at the end, toward the end of that. Um, I think so when the episode dropped, you weren't with with Whorehound anymore. I think when we recorded, you were, and then when it dropped, you were. Yes, yes, and that was really weird because that actually happened twice. Um, so I, <laughs> we did a group interview for uh, Sledgehammer Horror, mm-hmm. um, and we did it as a group. So there was like seven of us from the um, Film Fest. Um, George and I is the directors. Um, a couple of people from the promo team. Um, one of the the other reviewers so uh two of the other reviewers so that was no three geez sorry that's where my brain is um so it was like seven of us and it was a lot of fun and it's funny because we recorded it and we were all still with them and then at the end by the end we weren't but it was an opportunity you know to go on a show and talk about my first horror you know and it's like Mm -hmm. you can't turn that down it was a lot of fun and you know it he's a good dude he's doing a lot with horror and getting a lot of guests and that's one of his uh, steady show segments is my first time horror. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, you've been doing how long, how many years you've been doing film festival work? Um, but gosh, since 20, I think in the official capacity of working with the film festival behind the scenes and not just at the convention, but being Mm -hmm. a part of, um, writing for the magazine and the review team, I'm going to say 20, 2015, 2014? I think 2015. I'm going to be comfortable and say 2015. Okay. Okay. And like, so what, what all for people to listen that don't know a director, that's not just like, what goes all into it other than just, you know, like here's a bunch of films and we're scheduling them. Like it's, it's (laughs) more like. It is a lot of, I don't think people realize it's a lot of administrative work as Mm -hmm. well. So, um, so prior to becoming the director, um, I was the um, I was on the film festival selection committee as well as the operations and promotions manager 
and at the convention, I uh, ran the promo team. And so th there's a lot that's involved with that. And, you know, you, you have to have different pieces and different people in the proper place to make a, a festival work. And that comes mm -hmm. from, you know, volunteers to the people that are behind the scenes, watching the films, rating the films, reviewing the films. Um, you're doing a lot of contacting of filmmake with, you know, filmmakers. You have to make sure people are watching the movies and keeping up to, you know, their commitment. Then you also have the administrative piece of it, which is anything from doing the promotions, um, scheduling volunteers, scheduling the programming, the films. There's just so much involved and it really is like, it's, it's more than a full-time job because jobs end after eight hours, you may do a little, you know, bit at <laughs> yeah. home, but if you add up all the hours, if you are getting anywhere between 150 to 300 hours of films, and that is a lot. So even what people are presented, that's nothing compared to the amount of films that we actually received and watched, you know, so it is a grueling job, but, you know, I love it, but there's just, there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, that's not even talking about the programming of actually programming the films that are screening, um, getting the, the films, downloading them, getting them all ready to be shown, doing filmmaker biographies, making laurels. <laughs> it's just, it is, a, it, it's a lot. Um, and so, you know, when you got, when people out there are watching film festivals, whether they're virtual or in person, a lot of work goes into it. An unbelievable amount of work goes into it. And you're only as good as the people that are working, you know, with you. No, nobody does it on their own. Um, and it's nice to have a solid team behind you, but it, it is a, a, a great deal of work, but it's so rewarding and it's so much fun because it's that fire that when you see that perfect film and you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for other people to see this. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you get so excited because you may watch 10 movies that day. And, you know, there's been days where you're just like, you know, I none of these were like hits for me. And then like your last movie, you're, I'm going to watch one more. And then that might be the saving grace or that really good film that moved you may be the third out of, you know, 15 movies that day. Mm -hmm. Are there any like roadblocks or hurdles that come with films that you have to like do like background checks on, like where like someone submits a film, but they, because they were in this festival, they have to wait X length before they can go to another or. Well, they... that piece of it usually comes for, from, so that's kind of a two-parter. So that piece where if it can't be shown at your festival, it has to show here, that usually comes with like films that are um, in distribution or they are close to being signed and the distributor is saying, well, what, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, even until this is, you know, signed, you can't play it here. As far as the background and looking at things, I feel like it's our responsibility to check on certain things. So like if a movie, if, uh, if we had a category called um, best first time filmmaker, mm -hmm. and that was a category that, that we really pushed for and that we won it for years, but we were actually able to do it. Um, the last two cycles of Horror Hound and when we um, did PopCon, that was always in our plan from the beginning to have a best first time filmmaker. We just feel like that's a really important, mm -hmm. you know, it's an important category um, because, you know, you're doing it for the first time and it, it, it means a lot to get that film out and that um, completion. So sometimes people put their film in as first time filmmaker and that's one of the things I think we check the most because just from knowing films and working with multiple people, it's like, wait, that name is familiar. I don't think that person's a first time filmmaker. How are they entering this? And so then you got to go IMDB, you have to go to their social media and kind of see what they're doing. But it's just, and we do that because we feel like it's only fair to the other people that are entering that particular category. That one's just a little bit you know, because it's all in the name, first time filmmaker, <laughs> you know, yeah. so you have to be, you know, that's the one we diligently check because we want to make sure that things are right. And they, sometimes it could be a slip of, you know, there's yes and no questions when you're submitting your film. It could be that you mistakenly did it and it registered that way. Um, it's just one that we really try to, you know, pay attention to. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
And you, you mentioned you watch them all. Like, how, what do you have a criteria for like critiquing that helps keep even the lowliest of them on your mind or the middling one? I guess you'd remember the lowly, but the middling ones, like, to keep them in, you know, for judging. Yeah, one thing is keeping great notes. Um, yeah. You, you have to keep really good notes. Um, the nice thing about Film Freeway is there's a section in there just for notes too. Um, and every time you're doing your review, so like for instance, when you have, let's say you can only have, you know, time-wise you may have 60 to 80 films in your festival. Let's just give a roundabout number or something like that. And you know that you've got X amount of time of programming. So every film can't get in and, and you know, and so when you when me personally when I start going back and looking at those films I go back and look at I kind of set a parameter for the ratings and go up and pull all the movies between this and this or the ones that are this way and below and those are the films that are easier to say okay for my vote that this one doesn't standard wise you can't put like a movie that's rating a three into your film festivals right. with an average of movies that are rating, you know, six to nine. It just, it, it's not gonna work. Um, so I feel like as far as remembering movies, when you get to certain numbers, sometimes that gets hard, but you just have to go back through. And sometimes it takes multiple times of going back and looking at every movie that you rated. And, you know, especially when you're doing like awards, yeah. trying to figure out who's gonna get nominated for things and you're looking at, you know, all these different categories. So it is a, a tremendous amount of work. And that's, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because it's, there's movies that I've had to watch two or three times. It may have come at the beginning of the cycle. And then when I'm going back and looking at my oh, things, yeah. trying to narrow my list down, I'm like, oh, you know what? I think I need to watch that again. Or no, I remember this one. Or was this one that was kind of like this movie is like the same, we've had movies with the same name before. Um, <laughs> so it's like, go in and figure out which movie. So we had to make sure we didn't, you know, put those movies together or make sure, you know, when you're giving descriptions, you've got the right description there. Um, but it is, it's a process and it's one that you have to give a lot of time to. You can't just, right. you know, you know, you just, it, it, it's a lot because you are seeing hundreds of movies. And last year, 20, 2020, I would say we watched doing some rough math. I'm going to say about 550, maybe. And that includes shorts and features, right. some cool music videos, some awesome documentaries. Um, it's a variety, so, at least. What was that? It's a variety. Yes, yes. that it, it, it was a variety. And that, you know, that's... And with PopCon, there was even more of a variety. Yeah. Do, do you uh, like for, you know, you get done watching all these like festival films. They're like, all right, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to watch this movie or this TV show. Is that how you do you unwind by watching more stuff? Uh, kind of. There's some go to's yeah. <laughs> because there's and, and we do this a lot. And it's just like, you know what? Um, and, and sometimes it's not even that it was a bad movie. Sometimes they're really emotional movies. Oh, OK. And you need to you know, or it's really creeped you out, but not creepy, like it's scary, but it's more of a, that realistic creep. Like they did some mm -hmm. really heinous things that are, that you can actually see happening in real life. And it's more like crime thriller movies, not just horror. And you're like, oh, that's messed up. And it's like, you got to have your happy place. You have to, right. you know, watch some comedy. And I'd say one of my go-to things to watch <laughs> after one of those episodes is uh, like Harlem Nights, um, or coming to America, um, road trip is a good one. Um, oh, accepted anything, Justin Long, that's mm -hmm. comedy. Oh, Sasquatch gang. I don't know if you know about that movie, but it is amazing. It's so much fun. Um, it's Justin Long and Joey Kern and, uh, okay. Jeremy Sumter. And it is so out there it kind of puts you in the mind of napoleon dynamite with the quirkiness okay. but it's nothing like it it's, gotcha. it's super and like i say anything justin long and we probably got i've got a lot of justin long he he needs to get his own section because like eddie murphy has his own section right. there's i mean and there's because we have like so many eddie murphy movies but harlem nights is definitely one of those movies or coming to america that i know verbatim from beginning to end 
and it just kind of relaxes and chills, makes me laugh, and I just kind of forget about that's a terrific all, damn movie. All the, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah. I used to people used to think I was crazy because when I when I lived in Los Angeles, I did Blu-ray and DVD testing, and I watched movies all day not just eight hour shifts sometimes it'd be long shifts right. and I, I would come home to unwind by watching late night oh like watching my primetime television or watching a movie and people were like what you you sit there and watch movies all day to go home like there's a difference when you're selecting or it's what you are opting it's not yeah. like hey here's harry potter and the order of the phoenix in dutch <laughs> there you go have a good one see you in yeah. two and a half hours it's not like like they, they don't understand. Like here is um, let's see uh, uh, Wallace and Gromit, Curse of the Were Rabbit for the nineteenth time. Here you go. Yep. It's like of course I can turn on like a TV show that I like and enjoy that. Like a right, it's different work. Like and I'm taking That's notes and I have to watch for things. Yeah, or something like people don't understand. Like you can you can do other TV and movies to unwind from watching. TV and movies it's yeah because it's it's and it's because you you want to watch it at that point not because you have to be and especially one of the hardest things about a film festival is keeping up with the films and right. making sure that you know you are steadily excuse me watching and so you don't have to cram to meet your you know watch all these movies 30 movies to meet your deadline right. and plus that's just not a good way to go because you're going to miss, I think you just kind of, if, if you are watching so many at one time, it just, maybe you're, you're, you get jaded or you're like, I had enough of this today. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I have to watch the movies and you don't want to watch the movies. So you got to have that, that, that um, perfect blend of pacing, because if you don't, you're going to burn out or you're going to get, get overwhelmed because you watch so many then you're going to get frustrated and it's like well did you really give that movie a fair shot because you know you may have been just overwhelmed and tired or right you watched that's what i always that. like to tell people i'm like don't always if you didn't enjoy a movie maybe give give those another chance rather than the ones you love because yep. if i'm in a foul mood i might like if i was like i'm gonna go see this at the theater this weekend or actually for now select it on my streaming device I, I might go not today. I have a headache or something like that. Like yeah. I, I want to give it the fairest shake I can. And that really affects how you watch something. So you may have, it does. I, and if I know I'm in a certain mood, I won't go and watch, you know, something like, cause you can, I don't read every now and then I'll read the description of the film. Mm -hmm. I never read biographies of the films before I watch them ever. Right. Um, so I'm like, Oh, this is kind of a really, serious realistic subject matter about something you know like about child abuse or you know something that's really you know serious and i'm like i mean it's not like the film is just about child abuse but that is what's happening right. in the film and then xyz happens from there and it's just like you know i'm just not not in the mood to be emotional you know super emotional about a movie right now i'm going to save that when i'm in a better mood right. so it's like you got to know yourself too and you know when you're watching these films because sometimes your mood sets you know, a tone or sets of right. pace. You, you you need to be in the right headspace because remember, this is a job. The, the you're, you're watching people's films and all the hard work that they put into right. making this film, and to give it the fairest chance possible, you have to make sure that you're ready to do your job that day. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Well stated. Um, last year, uh, all, I mean, all your film festivals and stuff were virtual. Yep. which I know it's not the preferred or ideal method to go about these, but what advantage and benefits did you did come with it? Like what things could you take from here on or what did you enjoy more about doing it virtual? Than um, I mean, that's a great question. And I know that people miss being around each other and being in person, but with working with the film festivals for so long, what I did see is people didn't have to worry about traveling and making accommodations to attend. Mm -hmm. People didn't have to worry about um, not being able to see their film screen or see, seeing any interaction because they couldn't make the fest, you know, make the festival. So I feel like this gave filmmakers and you know their families, friends, people that may not go to a convention or people that like 
just films, but also had to compete with the convention all the time. It's like, okay, I'm at the convention. Now I got to plan my movie time. I want to see these five movies and I've got to work them into my day. People were just actually able to engage and watch the films and not have to worry about making it from one location to the other to get back from across, you know, the right. convention to get to the film room. Um, so I feel like for the filmmakers, it was very um, positive because they were able to be there. They were able to interact with, with each other and they were able to still see people interacting about their film, you know, in mm -hmm. the chat room or during the, um, the live screen, you know, where we're all streaming and watching together. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that was a very positive aspect. And it was also a learning experience for us because we were able to get a lot of that feedback directly from the filmmakers. Um, of what worked and why they liked it. And they felt like um, we had one filmmaker say they never felt so engaged with their audience before. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's saying a lot because this person has watched his films at a film festival with the audience yeah, in attendance. And he just said he felt so much more connected to you know, the other filmmakers and the audience. And they thought that it was great to have a, you know, a chat going and to have that interaction. And I, you know, I, I gotta say, I feel the same. Um, mm -hmm. It has its pros and definitely um, its cons, but I feel like people were so accepting and open to it. And I don't know if it was because they had to or because they actually were like, hey, this is actually pretty cool because now I really can be in attendance if I've got five films playing throughout the course of this year at different festivals, mm -hmm. probably financially, they may not have been able to go to five. Right. You know, yeah, festivals. that's true. And um, there's things like uh, Chelsea Christopher was on the show. Her film bleeding audio got accepted into slam dance this year. Mm -hmm. And I was wow. following that quite well. And that um, it was like a, a app on like your Roku box or whatever you use and it looked like a streaming service to pick the films and stuff. And for 10 bucks, you could detent slam dance. So I think the access got out there to more people yeah. for their films because you didn't have to travel there for this year. You could be in anywhere in the US and watch slam dance films. And they were getting a lot of feedback on Twitter. Reviews were up probably for them because sites who couldn't send people could now cover it. And I think Sundance had a something similar to that too but uh it was really neat to see it that way i know she she really wanted to be in attendance at slam dance and show right. her film with people but i think it went really well um for her she won an award there too so that was great oh, awesome. too but um yeah like looked really cool the way they had i know not everybody has the financial backing that slam dance does to create mm -hmm. an app with selectable movies and stuff but that was just right. a thing like hey i got in slam dance and more people probably saw my film this year at slam dance than would have at that festival but yeah i mean so it's i mean if you talk to enough filmmakers you're going to get a um you know a lot of feedback you know like i said pros and cons but i for the most part i mean a majority and i mean i'm talking high percentage like 85 mm -hmm. you know percent were very um accepting and thought it was a great idea to do the virtual fest the way it was done um, gotcha. and have some interaction. And I think with some of the bigger festivals that just had streaming, I'm sorry, that just had, a, you could select it, it was more interaction. And mm -hmm. I think that's what people were missing. So when they got some of that interaction with each other and other filmmakers and they could ask questions and we did the Q and A's, mm -hmm. uh, we did the post screening Q and A's after every block. So people were able to, you know, ask questions and um, we were able to just talk about the films that had just screened. So that was that, you know, that was a lot of fun. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, so PopCon with uh, the, will there be screenings of, was there, I mean, I don't know if this year PopCon or whatever, cause it's very, it's reduced capacity. Yeah, so we are for... having an in-person um, and it will be the convention and the film fest, but we are also going to have a, part of that um the film fest be virtual as well to where okay. people can actually see the movies also so it'll be in person but that's the piece we wanted to still be able to give people that could gotcha. not make it whether it was a financial thing or they didn't want to travel or they just still are not ready to be in you know 
large crowds. Right. So we get that. And and the thing is, <laughs> when we first had talked about this, um, it was always kind of a thought that this might happen anyway, before, not, virus aside, that how can we get films out to more people to be able to see? Because that is the whole goal of a film festival anyway, period. I mean, the top goal is to get those films out to people to see because you want them to see them. That's the whole, you know, the whole point is you want to introduce these to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Do you want to move on to the Wraith? Yeah, I ready? am ready. All right. I am ready. All right. Here we go. The Wraith. It's written and directed by Mike Marvin and stars Cheryl and Fenn, Charlie Sheen, Nick Cassavetes, Clint Howard, and Randy Quaid. It's about a young, it's after a young man is murdered by a road racing gang of motorheads, a mysterious fast driving spirit descends from the sky to take revenge. So Audrey, I always ask this. Um, so with the Wraith, what is it that made you choose this and bring it to the show? Um, gosh. Okay. So I, I got to pick my movie. So I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to do, you know, when we talked and it was like, it's hard for me to ever pick one movie for anything, right. you know, you like favorite movie, favorite this. And so I thought about, you know, like what my favorite, one of my favorite sci-fi movies is what my favorite horror, my favorite, you know, comedy and the Wraith. I don't know why that movie resonates so much with me. The only thing I can think of is of being, a kid and in the summer it coming on like Showtime or something like that all the time. And the very first time I saw it, I was like, this is actually pretty awesome. It, it blended my love of, I mean, because it was definitely more, you know, sci-fi. It's not really, it's not a horror movie, but it just blended my love of, of sci-fi and kind of the teen movie. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. a, a, a slasher. It wasn't a this, it wasn't a that. It was kind of like so... It's like a hodgepodge of what you just yeah, said, it was, you know? And it was independent of, you know, movies at that time. It wasn't like the Valley Girl. It wasn't like, you know, it, it just, it, it had its own, um, it had, like it had the, its own um, little niche. Have you, seen, have you seen Class of 1984? Oh, yeah. With, yeah, it's um, kind of got that vibe in it, too a bit but continue sorry yeah well, class of 84 my oh i'm sorry i'm thinking just class with um no, uh, the with, one with um, all the the punk rule the school kind of thing and uh, yes yes i do know what that has is. to go on and, like fight them yeah kind of has that element of kids but go ahead continue sorry oh no you're fine no i just i don't know what it is i think it just reminds me of a a different you know, time of being a kid and it was actually really cool. And you've got the bat, you know, there's a character that's for everybody, but they all weren't cliche yet. Um, right. You know, I just felt like watching that movie is you kind of knew somebody like that, you know, especially, you know, like in your teen years, it's like, you kind of know each one of these, you know, characters, you know, there's the, you know, the innocent girl that, you know, she's not so innocent, but she seems sweet and she's, you know, nice to people. She's not a, you know, super bitch to where, you know, as soon as you see her, you're just like, oh my gosh, I hate her. I can't wait till this happens. You know, it was kind of a little, she was a little vulnerable. She was very likable. She was very relatable without being two goody two shoes. I mean, kind of like Lori with Halloween, you kind of related to her, but Lori was just a little too squeaky clean. Right. Well, I, I do like with the Sherilyn Fenn character, uh, they, it's not just like, why would she ever date this guy to begin with or something like, you know, the girl dating the jerk. She's afraid of this guy. Right. She's not yeah. really, she's just kind of submissive in a way that she doesn't want anyone to get hurt mm -hmm. and it's very believable. So, and it was very ahead of its time with the portrayal of that character like that. I think mm -hmm. that um, it showed a vulnerability. And like you said, you think, oh, why is she doing that? She's kind of dumb. But it's like she knows his wrath. She knows that he is not a good person. And he is very, um, one of the most dangerous things is someone with a easily bruised ego. Yeah. And that, and it doesn't matter whether it's a man or woman, it, it doesn't matter. People that easily are bruised tend to lash out at people all the time and in certain ways. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's verbal, sometimes it's, you know, doing some behind the scenes, um, shit talking to other people to, you know, keep trouble going. So yeah. 
um yeah it just and he was easily bruised and whenever he got easily bruised he reacted in a very negative and violent way and she even though she couldn't remember what happened that night of the movie which we might spoil later oh, yeah. um she still knew independent of that that he was a bad dude right yeah yeah no he's a extreme type i mean it's, it's a little bit heightened because it's a movie but yeah he's you know this type type of guy mm -hmm. around like he uh he's just loves his control no one's badder than him and when someone comes yeah. to town that might just be cooler than him yeah <laughs> i love that yeah it's it's upset. Like yeah, he just might be cooler. And, you know, he's dangerous to his friends. He's dangerous to the public. He's, you know, yeah, and that's the thing. He really had no friends. He had cronies that were afraid of him. I'm like, right. how lonely are you? And then you kind of I mean, for a, a split half a fucking second, you might feel a little bit sorry for Packard, I, at least even watching it now and as an as an adult. It's one of the movies that holds up. So that, to circle back to your question of why I picked this yeah. one, it holds up. You know, so yeah. each, you know, this has always been a movie I've periodically watched throughout, you know, the years that it's been around and it holds up. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a super 80s movie. It could only have been made then. Uh, it holds up like every, like I think of those, like a lot of those independent, like a lot of these filmmakers try to make these retro flicks. And yeah. I really think this is kind of the one that they're striving to be like. This is like when they try to make those yeah. sci-fi, but feels like it was from a different era. Your your Turbo yeah. Kids, those those type of movies. Uh, yeah. This they want to they want to hit whatever lightning in a bottle the Wraith caught is what they're trying to go for. And it was and, so and the Wraith was so simplistic because it didn't do too much sci-fi. You knew it was sci-fi because. It's, you know, it's very ambiguous and they don't yeah. care that they need they don't need to explain everything you nope. just aliens supernatural ghosts it's something like yeah it, yeah yeah you and it almost gives you a little hope that you know if you were wrongly you know if if you died a violent death or you were killed before your time or something like that that there might be a chance that you can come back and get a little revenge mm -hmm. you know it's a you, different, you, a really different kind of revenge tale too. Yeah, like it's, yeah, it was because it, you can come to stay, you can come to visit, but you can't stay. And I love that every time I watch that, it's always it's inevitable. Like the first couple times I watched it, and I, you know I had to watch it again. I'm like, did I miss it? Did I miss that this is what was going to happen? And even watching it now, you still don't think that it's going to be the way that it was. You right. think, okay, this person's coming back for revenge. It's going to you know, they're just maybe in a different body and they're going to stay and, you know, they're going to live happily ever after here and have a, a love, you know, lovely time with their family, friends and loved ones. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like that. And I think I love that part I, of it. I, li I like, that's what I like about, um, a lot about, um, you know, nowadays we have movies that are fine tuned. They're made by algorithms and all sorts of, they're always like knit perfect, but I enjoy a looseness a little sloppiness from like the eighties and nineties when people are trying yeah. things out. I appreciate that. I, I like that. It doesn't have to explain. I can use my brain and come up with things and maybe you think something different or we see around the same, mm -hmm. explain the same thing differently. And I, I don't, I think we lack that. Now people try to make ambiguous, but I don't think this right. was intentionally ambiguous. They're like, those aren't what's important for your entertainment. You still don't know what the rate is. I mean, yeah. it, it was, it was never explained what the wraith was, and I like. You, you will come back to life and have a cool car. Like we will, we'll do that. You you have a vehicle with you. You can give it away at the end, you know. But I think the reason he had a cool car is because he had to bait him. He had to have right. something that would make. Oh you yeah. Know, th that would draw him to him, and he knew that. I mean, that was it. So it was like a grand design. Like I said, it, there's so many things was you know, what was it? We know that in the essence that it was, you know, that it was Jamie. We know mm -hmm. that in the essence, that's what it was. No, there were, there was no trying to get around it and it make and fool you. You knew from the beginning, you Something's know, what's up with this, this guy is connected to Jamie somehow. Yeah. Like that was, that was, and then it, it, you know, it actually is. Um, there's one thing that was, uh, weird that, uh, when the Wraith, he, he shows up in the motorcycle helmet, the costume, 
And every time he kills one of the bad guys, like there's a brace that disappears or goes away. Yeah. And apparently that is when the Wraith appears, he's not very strong the first time. And every mm-hmm. time he does that, he gets, he loses a brace, which makes him stronger. He's gaining his strength back. Apparently that's what huh, I read. I never dire- really that's what the, thought about that. That's what the red, the director said, because apparently that confused a lot of people. I just wondered if I was missing something the whole time with those braces. I was like, wait, I- is he <laughs> building a car? <laughs> is that like the murder? Like where I the- kind of felt like okay. So you remember at the beginning when everything comes down from the different points in the sky, you've got yeah. like those five pieces that come and converge. Right. Yeah. I figured it was a celestial thing, or yeah. it's a for whatever things. So all of those things had to line up perfectly for him to be able to come back. Mm-hmm. And so each time he exacts his revenge, that's one of the you know then that's gone. That's done that's off your, on your checklist yeah. or something you know i it's funny that opening where they, they, after the credits they have those things show up in the carpet it looks like a teaser trailer like you can imagine going like this summer <laughs> when death isn't enough when you're drag and then like the wraith coming soon to a theater near you like it'd yeah. be like a perfect like 80s teaser trailer but it's the opening to the movie so it's really slick commercial like yeah i mean I, you know, it's funny because not that long ago, even before, we, and I didn't even go back and do it again before we started this, you know, we were going to do the show, mm-hmm. is I went to see what else that guy had done, and now I can't remember what I, yeah, I can't so even remember is, what I found. This is hilarious. Mike Marvin, he, he did this, he was the second unit director, the writer, and co-producer of Hot Dog the Movie, oh, She introduced nice. the world to Shannon Tweed as an actor, Yeah, uh, but in the 1990s, so get this, he does four softcore porn movies, but not under his name. He did That's them under, under the name Jake Casey, the character the, oh, she yeah. plays from this movie. Yes. So yes. that's what he did. And I guess he, he was involved somehow in the production of Better Off Dead, which is a John Cusack movie that I love. Uh, oh, yeah. so there was that that's what he did too but yeah he did these and he directed an episode of silk stockings in the 90s so uh, his heart his softcore porn cred led him to that i'm sure yeah. but um but yeah that's what that's what he had done um so and this was like one of those just darn near perfect um movies so when i think of movies that i don't know like the directors and they just like hit gold and Mm -hmm. you're like, okay, what else are they doing? Um, It reminds me of um, Les, I can't think of his last name, Les Mayfield, I believe, that did Blue Streak. Blue Streak was amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love that movie. They were going to make a sequel. They never did. And you know, maybe it's just better left alone. Just make another, like, that's what I think with like comedy movies a lot of times just get the get the get the gang back together do something else like get if that if blue streak worked mm-hmm. get get the director get martin lawrence and get luke wilson and go have him do something else yeah and i like that when directors work with the you know the same um steve martin and uh the guy who directed oh gosh i look like a bad film guy but uh the director of the jerk they did a bunch of movies together they always get together yes. do a different movie they didn't do the jerk too they didn't you know right just let's make another funny movie yeah, and you use the same stars, you know. Mel Brooks is, you know, notorious for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Christopher Guest and his gang of people. They don't, they don't make yeah. like waiting for, or still waiting for Guffman. They don't do that. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know why. I love this movie so much, and I, I don't know. It was just. You know, it, it had so many elements in it. It was just, you know, the bad guys, the, the people that are kind of on the outskirts. Um, mm-hmm. You've got, you know, this guy that is a bully to everyone. He, and he's a cheater. I don't yeah. like a cheater. You nope. know, even from that first, like I had him pegged like so, so easy. I, it was just like, he was so, and I don't even want to say one dimensional because he wasn't one dimensional because he did have a lot of layers. Yeah. But he was still so weird and lonely. I mean, right. and not lonely, he had people around him, but when you can't form a bond and it just makes you a mean, bitter asshole. And he was just <laughs> mean and for no yeah. reason. I mean, it's kind of like you have to put your, the one thing I like about this film is you put your own 
backstory to the characters because you don't get a lot of backstory right. except for Jamie and oh gosh, gosh, what's I'm just having a brain lapse what her character's name is. Sh- Sh- Sherlyn Fenn's character. Sherlyn yeah. Fenn's character, yes. Why am I having a brain lapse? But everyone else, you know, and the brother, you you know, have a little background on the brother because, you know, the history there. But everyone else, you got to put together what their home life might have been like. You know, their siblings, mm-hmm. if, if they went to school, they were in high school and you didn't even see one high school scene except no. they're coming out. But you knew they were in high school and it's just like, okay. <sighs> Or at the very uh, least, maybe Packard wasn't, and she still was, and the other right. guys weren't. But well, I think maybe like you know, with Packard, like you know, they murdered a guy. So in his mind, at some point, some he's gonna get caught, or it's mm-hmm. gonna come back to him, or he's paranoid about that, or he's he thought he took out his guy at the top. And at the beginning, we see him race and cheat to win a race against exactly. a guy, which he may be thinking, oh, crap, my time's coming. Someone's going to knock me off my pedestal, and he's mm-hmm. extra crazy. And then here comes Charlie Sheen, and he's like, that's it. That's the next thing I have to take out to keep my... Yep. He was so mind. determined um, that he couldn't. He missed the bigger picture. Yeah. You know, It was right there for him and with a little imagination. And I think a couple of times he did know... Mm-hmm. And he was scared to admit, you know, even before the scene where they he go into the, you know, the car goes into the graveyard and ends up right in front of his grave. Right. He still knew even, I feel like before that, I mean, it's kind of like one of those scenes and he's watching them. I mean, he, and he's looking at them when he's, um, when they're at the river and they're doing, they're kind of floating down the lazy river mm-hmm. and his point of view, and you see him looking and you assume, or like when you first see it, he's like kind of looking, you think he's looking at her and seeing what she's doing, but he's not looking at her. He's looking at Jake. Right. And he's looking at Jake like there's some familiarity and why is this bothering him so much? And why is... Well, the guy they cast to be the the Jamie look kind of like, like, you know, it's not Charlie Sheen, but like they fit the same frame and hair the, the and profile, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the jaw the chip you know it wasn't right. a far cry it was a different face but very a lot of right. likeness in the in similar the facial features field. too yeah, yeah like yeah that was yeah it was really crazy so yeah i could get that um i would say like also there's a little bit more depth to like randy quaid's character the mm-hmm. asshole detective so he comes in like this hot shot going all this and hitting all getting all the punks but he even has like the moment like when he walks in the garage um, uh, to get Packard, and he's mm-hmm. like hooking up with that girl. Yeah, and he makes him leave, and he goes to the girl. He's like, "Are you okay?" Like, yeah, because he knows, like he, and it's kind of interesting, and it's kind of humorous how he, he's after the wraith because there's murder in town, but then he realizes the trajectory of the murders, and he's like, "Yeah, it's like I mean, there's only aimed at one, pe- you know, one group of people. So how bad do we really want to catch? This? He's doing my work for me right yeah, now." He's cleaning up the town scum. And and the other thing too is what they were doing was really dangerous. I mean, yeah. they were doing it to a point where they were, you know, threat. I mean, what they threatened to do to the guy's girlfriend at the beginning. I mean, that that's not stuff you take lightly. No. You, know, you know, there's like a group of five guys and it's you and your girlfriend and they're threatening to do things to her. And you're like, okay, this is my only way out. I'm going to race. Um, but you know, back to, you know, Randy Quaid, he had to try to have some law and order in his town. He couldn't just have people racing and doing things like that. But like, there was a definitive thing when he told him at the police station, basically, why am I really looking for this guy? Because he seems to only be after you and your friends. Right. Yeah. And then Packer kind of stops and they, they look at each other and, you know, they're like, oh, shit, he might have a point there you know, why is someone after us? Right. Why, why, why? And they're thinking no one knows what we did. Dude's dead. So why would anyone be after us? Only Clint Howard could put it together. I know. <laughs> I love that movie. Um, so one of my favorite parts in there is when the Wraith comes in and he starts like shooting up everything. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And- yeah. <laughs> like really early. It's surprising. He's like, Oh, whoa, he's going to take him down now. Yeah, but he's just messing up the garage. He just was getting them where it hurt, you know. He was just leaving, you know, them to make the the, the decisions he knew that they were gonna make. And he goes, um, 
um, Scott or what? No, it's not Scott. What was his name? Oh crap! I'm just having a brain lapse. And he's like, "Who was that guy?" He was like, "I don't know," but he sure is weird and pissed off. And that is like <laughs> my favorite movie. And when Gutter Boy is like trying to get away, and he's like scooting on the little um, tray that you lay on when you're going yeah. in the car with the rollers, and he's like in fast motion, like flying across the <laughs> across the garage, like that was the best. Oh God! I love that movie. Well, I love the way he says, "You lose the race, you lose your car." <laughs> like I, I love the the way he delivers that, and and the way he does his little whip. Oh yeah, he comes up on one leg. It was like he had a whole technique. Right? Yeah, I know he was he was pretty funny. Uh, I oh gosh, you know I being you know older and watching this movie, I would have never thought of it back then. But I'm watching this, and I'm like if they only had like charlie sheen for like three days to shoot because he appears in the same places with the same it's like he's very like they make him there throughout but he's you can tell he's very limited in his use and when i finally realized it was that garage scene because there's a quick insert of the mask coming up freeze framing and his head being in there yeah like they did some sort of thing i'm like and then I realized, I'm like, yeah, he's definitely not the guy in that suit. I know that, but he's supposed to be. And they use this suit guy as much as possible. I agree. And, you know, I wonder if he was coinciding with something else. He I was looked, feeling like. I looked it up. I young looked guns. It up. You know, he was on. So he picked up this movie to do on his way to the Philippines to shoot um, oh, um, Platoon. Apart- Oh, platoon. platoon. Yeah. So he stopped in Arizona for like a little bit, shot this movie, and then went on his way to the Philippines to shoot Platoon. And I was like, okay, it makes sense. And then, like, I guess Oliver Stone saw the Wraith, didn't like it, and was pissed. And he's like, you really think the Wraith is going to stop people from seeing Platoon? Like, yeah. Uh, but you know, it's funny. There's another part of this too that the Charlie Sheen factor is Johnny Depp was on set the whole time. Uh, cause he was dating Sherilyn Fenn and stayed the whole production. Wow. And I'm willing to wager. He found out Charlie Sheen was cast in this. And so he was there. The and he's time. like, um, I need to watch. I, I, I'm going to watch out here. No, oh, I'll, I'll take off time. I will go. However long this shoot is Sherilyn. We're I'll be there for you. But I know he was probably like, I know that <laughs> Sheen guy. I, and that's, here's the thing. And at that time, Charlie Sheen was extra fine. I mean, he was, I mean, a little bit later, he got like, he looked really good in Young Guns. I mean, he had gained a little weight for that. Maybe, I don't know. Well, the Hot happened. Shots movies too, he was in good shape. Yeah. Oh yeah, that he he looked good in that too. I mean, he's always been a good looking guy. I mean, not so much now, but he's, he's, he's always, and it's so funny because they looked so much alike back then, Charlie and Emilio. Oh yeah. So much alike, you know? I mean, they still look alike now, but Emilio still looks more like their dad, you know. Yeah, yeah. Than than Charlie ever did. I mean, they you can definitely tell they were brothers and they had different aspects of them. But as they've mm-hmm. aged, Emilio um, uh, Emilio still looks a lot like his dad. Yeah, uh, and you know, speaking of that, like, so this is this is an interesting little tidbit. D- don't know if it's intentional. This happens a lot, <laughs> but so two of the movies, two of the leads in this movies are the sons of famous movie stars you got yep, Martin not, Sheen yeah. and Nick or you have Charlie Sheen and Nick Cassavetes for yep. you know John Cassavetes um in a side note you also have Griffin O'Neill in this movie the son of yep. Ryan O'Neill yep. and then there's two brothers of stars in supporting roles with uh, Clint Howard and Randy Quaid <laughs> so yep. this is the uh relatives movie though yeah. Charlie Sheen became a gigantic star in his own yeah. right um and Cassavetes became a, a really, really good director. Like his yeah. dad, I mean, he went into yeah. writing and directing and he did a lot of, 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 of good stuff. I'm a huge fan of his. I, you know, and it's funny watching him in the early, in those early works. I mean, he's still mm-hmm. done acting and stuff here and there, but he has done some really, you know, phenomenal directing and, and, and producing and writing. And he's had really good hit movies and TV series and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's it, and it's good. And Sherilyn Finn went on to do, you know, big things. She's got yeah. cult status and Twin Peaks, and also yeah. like but she is like unrecognizable in this day. Like if I didn't wouldn't have seen her name in the credits, I'd be like, well, I know her from somewhere. What is it? Because she's tan. She's mm-hmm. normally white. 
like or, yeah. or paler and um blonder like she's sure she went with like twin peaks came around she stuck with that black hair i know she did play a role super blonde at one point later on but she was yeah she had that um, up being on a uh, ray donovan um, oh yeah yep seasons and oh man she was wicked i mean it was a really good she was um uh uh what's his, hank azaria's wife on that show yeah yeah yeah, yeah. she's really yeah she's really good she, i mean she was a fox back then though when she was uh twin peaks era and stuff like she had a like iconic kind of like she could have been like i don't her career went the way it did but she had a look that could have been like if she was a humongous star she could have like she had like an iconic look to herself with that like all those twin peaks he did very well with his young casting on that show they're all super talented and just yeah definitely but uh yeah i mean yeah she's and she's good in this very good in this movie um definitely early role. she's 21 when she i was like how old is she when she did this so 21 years old Wow. because it's a couple of years uh like three more years would be twin peaks for her Jeez. where she's playing a high schooler again um <laughs> it happens <laughs> yeah uh but no it's got a lot of racing in this movie a lot of and it's a lot of crashing pretty decently filmed i would say it's not the best like shot for shot but like i, I was definitely into it and watching that cool car go around to everything yeah the car was pretty cool especially when they lifted the hood and you saw the motor yeah and he's like um objection i don't think you should race he's like oh just put the you know the the tracker on there and he was just like and that's when he knew too like we're in deep shit you know it's right right oh gosh uh and uh there was a, a camera operator died making this movie Oh, where are you over him. I, I mean, I do my I, research and look, but I, you have gotten gold. I don't know where you, you, you deep dove on this one. I, I do. I do that. I do my research before I come on the show. Oh my I gosh. Feel I feel like, like such a loser. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, so, I know a lot about this movie, but gosh, I didn't know about that. Unless yeah. I'm just old and forgot. Yeah. It, yeah. So someone, yeah, they, they did die. Another one was like injured pretty bad. So someone gave their life for the wraith. Um, happens time to time uh and it, it, it's kind of wish it could have been a bigger movie for the person because this one this only oh it's a cult classic now but it, it only is. it only played in 88 theaters when it opened and see now that's, that's just bad marketing not faith because i feel like at that time in the 80s i think this would have been a really yeah big movie if it, it was, had been. It hit on vhs like vhs made the wraith like that Oh yeah, and I know for a fact, being in my Blu-ray circles, it's one of the most demanded. It's not on Blu-ray yet, and it's a high-demand uh, Blu-ray. Like Lionsgate owns it, and watching, I watched it on the Roku channel, mm-hmm. and it looks like it's been prepped for a high definition, like it's been restored. And I know there's been rumor that the Vestron video line they do, where last year they came back from the dead and they did Little Monsters and uh, Shivers, oh, okay. Shivers, the Cronenberg film. Yeah. And there was rumor that uh, they have shot bonus features and stuff for the Wraith so that it's been worked on. I hope but so. I when would, it gets released, I don't know. I'd like to add that to my collection. Yeah, no, I, I want, yeah, I'd like to see this on there. It looked pretty good. Um, this one, uh, yeah, because this one has great explosions too. Yes. When, when that, uh, that garage blows up. That was a good one. I that is Craig R. Baxley. He's one of my favorite action directors. His level of explosion because I'm like, damn, that looked dangerous. I hope people like ran away to get hit by debris. Like, like there's wood shards. I like, I love those because I'm like, and when you, I don't know if it's my eyes, oh, but like, when you watch it, does it look like it almost closes in and then comes out? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. Like that's the power of it, and yeah. That's the thing. Like that's like uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven, New Blood. Not my favorite of the series, but it has one of the best explosions when they blow that house up. I'm like, agreed. And I'm like, they really blew these <laughs> things up, folks. Like this is danger. Like there's dynamite stuff. Like I don't think right. people really they take explosions for granted nowadays. But when I watch these '80s and '90s action movies and stuff, and they have explosions, I'm just like, Ooh. I get so happy because I'm like, people had to hide. A camera got hit right, by like, it on the cover. Sure we're safe. Yeah, like this is da- someone had to clean up. Like this is, <laughs> I hope they cleaned up. But this that was insane. Like just yeah. blow it. Like let's blow this thing up on for a movie. You know, and oh, I love it. I wish blow more things up. 
nowadays, I guess. Um, well, that- more practically, everything is on small model scales and it's built and it's right. made to explode. But you know, that there was no getting around that. That fucker exploded. I mean, that, it was, yeah. And you know, when I had just watched it recently, um, cars when they go down the hill and just like fire, like you would set hills on fire nowadays. Yeah. This is Arizona. This is a film in Arizona, but they still like get fires the too. Fires, you know, it's like, no, they're not caused, you know, from, you know, special effects. These are just people being careless with fucking cigarettes. Right. It's like, can you imagine there were no forest fires like that when they were filming in California and like Arizona and the cars tumbling down the hill yeah. on Charlie's Angels and explodes or the $6 million man and all the things that got burned <laughs> up and, you know, they were contained. It's like, oh, okay, we'll just go put that out. Right. Right. Oh gosh. It's so good. Oh, I love it. It's young people who actually, you have to appreciate this stuff. Like it's, it's insane. Uh, I, another, a little funny bit about this uh, in foreign territories, this was retitled as black moon rising two and sold as a sequel to the uh, Tommy Lee Jones movie from the eighties when it got released overseas. That happens Ooh, a lot. Was responsible for that shit. I mean, that was some trickery. That wasn't a hit movie itself. I <laughs> like, here's a sequel to this shit. Ah. And I think there's another name for it too. Not like retaliator or something. Okay. It's, there's another oh, name for it too. Yeah, it, it's that's that happened back then. It happens. I mean, it still happens nowadays. Oh, I mean, yeah. well, I mean, recently they uh, Captain America: The First Avenger years ago when that came out was just called The First Avenger uh, in other countries. Um, cause they didn't think people from other countries at the time would want to go see something with the word America in the title. <laughs> uh, but yeah. And it, and it had a, it had itself a soundtrack. There's money. Th- I mean, it's not cheap to get Ozzy Osbourne, Billy Idol's yeah. rebel yell, Bonnie Tyler, lion, Motley Cruz smoking in the boys room, Robert Palmer's addicted to love. Those yep. are like hits. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> like you don't just it had a great soundtrack and that's one of and maybe that's another one of the reasons i love this film because Mm -hmm. of the soundtrack it's it's, and the score is cool too yeah yeah it's pretty stellar um and i mean addicted to love really remember that was like the biggest song that was huge year it i believe it won best video it won best song at the mtv movies awards kids hey that's when mtv really played music yep all day long every day there were no reality shows yet or anything it was just pure unadulterated nothing but videos all kinds every genre tlc's waterfalls on the hour every hour (laughs) sometimes every 45 minutes (laughs) oh my gosh you said waterfalls (laughs) that was one of the videos that drove i'm like and then it won awards i'm like of course because you showed it all the time yeah, I honestly, there's sometimes I just can't even stand to hear that song. If it comes on, I'm like, beep, I'm, I, I just, I just can't. Yep. And then whenever you hear hear it on the radio, it's the un, it's the edited version anyway. So yep. it just takes away, like, there's so much more of that song and it's edited out. And so it's dumb. Yeah, yeah, no. I, but yeah, the, this killer soundtrack, I I was stunned. I was like, wow, that's, that's not cheap. Because I know, like, when... Uh, when canon they wanted they needed a hit they what they did um uh last american virgin like they tossed a ton of money on that soundtrack to get like the cars and REO yeah. speedwagon like big hits to put on there because they wanted this to be a teen mega teen success right. and it, it worked but like they had to pay like i think close to their budget for the movie for the music and that that can't i mean it's gonna be the case here and this is probably a cheaper movie than that like honestly yeah and and i'm so glad it has cult status because i'm sure at the time they didn't maybe their profit reward you know didn't pay off but with with the brilliance of you know vhs and actual video stores and you couldn't Mm -hmm. have the instant gratification of watching a movie right in your home as far as something and that's where a lot of a lot of movies that did not have good commercial success mm-hmm. went on to have a long life and make a lot of money right. in video sales and video rentals. So, because yeah, I mean, if you rented the wet Wraith, you were hanging out with the Wraith all weekend. Like, right, exactly. You know, You're gonna watch, watch it a Winter. couple times, and yeah, you know. And... Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Nope, you. <laughs> I was gonna say it was nice because. Um, 
about a week ago, the Wraith was on Comet and mm -hmm. I love Comet. I like to watch it while I'm working and, you know, kind of having it as background noise because there's always something horror sci-fi ish, but mostly usually sci-fi. So it's nice to have right. on. And it was really weird because, or just a nice coincidence. So the Wraith came on first and immediately after that, it was like a back-to-back -back, um, maximum overdrive came on. Haha, -ha, yes. The so Sheen right. Brothers double exactly. feature, yes. Exactly. And it's both, their sci-fi movies, you know. About um, vehicles. About vehicles, exactly. So I'm just like, I just want to like really hug the person that did this. I don't know if you did it, you know, if they strategically did it or it just kind of happened. But I'm like, that seems like there had to be some thought into that. I would love to have like a, a, a channel or a, an app that I can just curate. Like, I don't, I don't need the pick as you go. Like, I don't need the like on-demand movies i'm just like give me 24 hours and stuff to just program and i will yep. i will gleefully do it but i will theme you to death yes like who in the hell yeah <laughs> I, I would love to be that person that's an ideal job all right do we got any, well also i would point out that i think the wraith is one of those cult classic movies that i would still consider a cult classic like it's not like the thing or like Blade Runner are now where like everybody knows, like it's considered good now. Most people know it. I don't think it has like a small base, but I would think, I would think the Wraith is still one that goes under scene, doesn't get remembered, hasn't been seen, tougher mm -hmm. access. Um, and I think is one that can still hold that mantle in a time where it's harder and harder because the cult movies with the internet became shared, became known, became- right a lot bigger um and i think this one still hangs there as a true cult movie it doesn't it actually is and I'll, I'll say this other thing about so you know what you're always talking about i'm not a huge fan of remakes at all mm -hmm. um i i think i can count just off the top of my head and i don't care what um genre film genre it is that i i I can probably count five to maybe seven at the most remakes that I've liked or enjoyed. Um, and when I think about remakes or reimaginings and things like that, I feel like I would not be upset if someone remade or reimagined the rave. Right. I think it has, and I'll say this, and one of the reasons why is because you've got your sci-fi element. I mean, you can do so much with that. You can make the Wraith anything you want because it was never anything particular. So if you wanted to tell a similar story or it can be a whole nother story, but it's the same thing. Something comes back. How does it come back? You don't know. But the other piece I like about that, and you can really throw that into more of our modern time is a perfect meld of the Wraith and Fast and the Furious. You've got your race. Oh, yeah. There's never should have been, I mean, let's just be honest. There never should have been 10 Fast and Furious movies. Disagree. Period. I love them. In, in, in Disagree. my opinion. <laughs> I love that my, they keep going. I mean, it's crazy fun action. It is. Yes. But, and wait, if you add Hobbs and Shaw, is that 10 That's or 10. is that 11? That's 10. Or no, the next, well, wait, nine isn't out yet. Nine, we're waiting. Oh, it's not out yet. Okay. I mean, they have it. It's It was supposed to come out it's last year, but yeah. It's so one technically, of those. there's 10 in that series, mm -hmm. right? And uh, th okay. yeah, there's going to be, well, so yeah, the Hobbs and Shaw, if there's there's 10 completed movies, nine available to watch, basically. Gotcha. And there's another one on the way because they're wrapping I, it. I they're can wrapping, really see that They're element. wrapping it up. <laughs> being added to that because i mean the racing part it's huge there's you know that part's never going to go away so i can see that mindset of fast and furious and the illegal racing and all that being melded into the wraith and i would mm -hmm. actually watch that reimagining I had that thought of fast and furious this funny when i was watching it too i was mm -hmm. like this is an angle. This is, this is like an angle for like a Fast and Furious type thing. Exactly. You know, I I, I just like the um. Like I said, I've watched a few of the movies, and it's not that I hate them or anything. It's just I don't really. It's not my jam, but I have seen them, and I like some of the action in it. And you know, there's crazy stunts, and I like crazy stunts because I really like right. ab absurd action films, but. I, I myself, I was a doubter for a long time, and then I 
fell in love when I actually sat down to go through all to go through them. I think I it was around the time the sixth one came out. I was like, five, everybody talked about how great Fast Five was. I'm like, fine, I'll go through. And then I was like, you know what? They were right. They were right. I was wrong. They were right. But can you see that though? It's like yeah. I I don't mind you don't you know I I don't mind that one being touched because well and on your point uh, of the remake like remake got away from what it was supposed to be like a lot of times things were remade because they uh didn't work the first time they weren't a big hit someone trying right. it again or something was dated and they wanted to modernize their campfire tale or, or whatever they were talking about and now it was like well this was a hit before so let's do it again and it's like that's right. not no wait that that's not what we were but i mean once gus van sant made psycho anything was game and we've been living <laughs> in that since yeah so for sure for sure i would you know, love to see it. I would love to see a sequel um, or like I said, a reimagining. Mm -hmm. I just think it's one of those films. And then that. again, part of me doesn't want it touched, you know. <laughs> the Wraith with two eyes. So it looks like a two. <laughs> the Wraith. Yeah. That's I, great. I like so, it. it. Pick it up Now again. I'm going to be disappointed if it doesn't come out that way. There you go. With two eyes. <laughs> there we go. All right. You, any more on the Wraith? You know, Probably not. I just, okay. I don't yet. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those movies. People go watch it. Hopefully we, there weren't too many spoiler, spoilers, but you know, I, I don't know, like when your things post, I can't, I'm sure people can, can comment on it. I would really like to hear your thoughts on, on the Wraith. I would really, you know, like to see what you thought about it. If you liked it, loved it, what worked, what didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> It's not one of those perfect movies, but it's perfect for my liking. And it was perfect in terms of those good 80 movies that were teen driven, but they weren't teen ish. Like there wasn't right. a bunch of pattiness. It was just more, you know, kind of bad stuff. You know, right. it wasn't a lot of sunshine in this movie. And I think that's what sets it apart from other kind of movies that focus on, you know, solely teens, you know, just because there weren't a lot of adults except for like the cops. And right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was Definitely. nothing else. So they a whole movie carried by pretty much just teens, and it was all neg, you know, mostly negative stuff. And also, like if you've never seen The Wraith and you'd like to watch it, always every time I post an episode, check my show notes. I let you know where it's available and where you can find it to watch it. Uh, best can be for you. So I'll let you know whether it's on DVD, Blu-ray, 4K, Ultra HD, where it's streaming on a service that you subscribe to, where you can rent it, where you can buy it. So check that it's right now on the roku channel so if you have a roku box you can watch it there free of charge You're with ads in. with ads so all right we'll move on to what else uh this is what else this is where we talk about anything we may have uh put out in the world or something we may have watched read listened to lately and we just want to share so audrey what else okay i <laughs> I usually don't like talking about myself in that aspect of like what projects I have coming up or anything like that, but I will because it kind of covers what are you doing and what you've read. Okay. So um, in a couple of weeks, I will be um, filming She Burns in Hell Part 2, which is um, a fan film that is following um, Stephen King's Carrie. And it addresses that part of the book that um, the movies really didn't delve into. The miniseries kind of got into the investigations and things like that and what happened with mm -hmm. um, the town being totally destroyed and all, you know what happened at the prom. Um, a lot of people that have watched the, the movie and the remake don't realize there's about a quarter of that book that deals with the aftermath of Carrie and it's kind of all wo woven within the book. Are you talking about um, the, the movie, uh, the mini the series with uh, David Keith? That one, um, or? Angela and Angela Bettis and Candace. I think so. Um, oh gosh, what's Candace's last name? But so they did the re the 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 mini series for sci fi, but it did cover some of the things you know from the book when they were doing kind of the investigation. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is so much of that book that involves just personal testimony, the uh white commission, because people don't realize that Carrie did just didn't you know kill all the kids at the prom she literally destroyed the town mm -hmm. 
um, because of her telekinesis, she was able to pull meteors down and um, she was so powerful. So this part of this, um, what we're doing is telling part of that story of everyone's um, aftermath of Carrie. So it's mostly all the interviews and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so that's a lot of fun, but reading the book and I hadn't read it since I was a teenager. And I'm just like, you know, I forgot just how powerful and strong she was. You know, I'd love to see her in the Scarlet Witch and Jean Grey have a <laughs> battle royale, you know, you know, just, you know, Carrie's very powerful and what she did, you know, it could not be explained. Um, and there were some instances of things that happened with Carrie when she was younger. And it's just going to be a whole just wonderful little um, treat for people that really only know the movies and not the book. So doing that in a couple of weeks, I'm excited about that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, myself, I recently took in the movie Lucky on Shudder. Uh, was a uh, highly touted movie. Um, people, it's a uh, stars Brie Grant, and I believe she wrote it too. But it's a it's an interesting little take on the slasher genre, and I and um talking about uh you know women's issues in their roles in life. It's men and stuff, but she basically um she's a writer. Um, struggling to get her next novel out, I think, is what's going on mm -hmm. there. But basically, she wakes up in the middle of the night one night hearing something outside, and there's this like guy with a mask standing out in her yard looking at her. And she tells her husband, like, dude, well, there's a guy outside. He's like, oh, it's that guy. He, you know, he tries to come in here and kill us every night. And <laughs> so she's like, what? And they go through and they take care of the killer, and then he disappears. And then they have the cops, and he just keeps showing up like every night. Oh and my she keeps God! Having trouble, she keeps having trouble explaining this to like men in power and things like that. And it's it's fabulous. Like it's got great social commentary. It's got great slasher horror stuff. Mm -hmm. Bria Grant's terrific. Uh, and I really took. It's a short movie too. It's like an hour twenty three. But it, uh, I think it did some festival stuff last year too. But it's just premiered on Shutter recently. And I signed up for. Many people think it's weird. I'm a horror fan and I don't have shutter. I, I had it for like a year and I wasn't using it much because, yeah. and I've like, cause I have a, a big Blu-ray collection, all their catalog titles on there. I either had on Blu-ray already or was on like canopy, the free library app. And I was like, I, it's not benefit like this is for the person not collecting things i guess for the horror they can right. see the things they want to or people not knowing these things checking them out but they're, it's a it's a great app i think for horror fans to check it out um their original stuff i have noticed there's a lot more original stuff on there now than when i used to be. yeah but, it is it is um but i really like lucky uh quite a bit it's uh, very good it's only i i've heard some um Angry males have uh, bombed the reviewing on it. So it's only got like a three out of five. And I guess there, there's some. And you know, I, I don't know many, and, and I don't, and I've heard that just kind of like with some of the other reviews mm -hmm. that people go and bomb it. I, I just don't feel like they would take the time. I feel like they, they're they doing You'd be surprised. But yeah. And then I have heard, but there are some trolls that are just so determined to yeah. do, you know. Yeah whatever but that sounds really interesting it sounds like a really i dug it a lot uh, i'm a big slasher fanatic so anytime you take a new spin on it i'm there yeah. like whether you live or fail uh you know like I, I i dig it and this was i thought was pretty good and it, it i mean it's an hour 23 so it doesn't it's lean it doesn't overdo any of it um but yeah that was that was good um i also we talked you mentioned earlier did you watch coming to america yet I, I, we actually, it's funny, um, while we ate dinner and getting, you know, right before we started, we, uh, finished it. We tried it Friday and it kept, um, I think cause so many people were trying to watch right. it. Um, and it just kept, you know, kicking us out. So we just finished it today. We had 40 minutes left. Gotcha. Did you enjoy it? Mm, not really. Not it was really. okay. It, it, it had, it had some funny parts in there. I just, I just didn't feel the connection like I felt to the first one. And I didn't expect it to be like the mm -hmm. first one. I actually wanted it to diverge from the first one more. Right. Um, 
but it was nice, you know, seeing, you know, some of the, you know, the old characters, especially yeah. the barbershop guys, they're always, yes. you know, the, the, some of the funniest, you know, for me. Um, I'm just glad, I am glad they made it. I've been wanting a sequel. Was that the sequel I wanted? No, but I'm really particular about my comedy. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan and I almost didn't want to watch it, but I wanted to watch it to support it, of course. But Eddie Murphy is so brilliant to me. And I think, oh yeah, not that I want to compare everything, but I think, um, I think Harlem Knights and the Nutty Professor were his swan songs. I don't think he'll do- I thought, did you see Dolomite? Oh, I loved oh, Dolomite. Oh, yes. I thought like when he did a Dolomite, I'm like, oh, he's back. And then coming to America, I'm like, oh, this is going to be- I did not expect to like Dolomite mm-hmm. as much as I did. And I've known Dolomite in the comedy and the movie since I was a, you know, a, a teenager. Right. You know, and all those crappy movies, but they were good because they were funny and they were outlandish. And, you know, he was like the first, you know, cons- he wasn't the first black action star, but he was the first consecutive multiple movies, black action star, in right. my opinion. Now I, yeah. I could be wrong, but when I think about it, and I know there's, you know, like, Fred Williams and you know Roundtree um, and, and Roundtree, yeah, Jim but they Brown, yeah, yeah, but they weren't a continuous like um, character. They did action movies in different things, but so maybe right. I should say action serials. So when you think of like Die Hard movies, or you think yeah. about Schwarzenegger, you know, like you know movies, or if you you know did yeah. multiple movies. Well, you had them. Yeah, it was Dolomite and Shaft. Everybody else just did. Well, I guess well, no, hell of uh, uh, Harlem movies was only two for Williams and that's but I think that's the only yeah. thing I can yeah, think of that but he, Dolomite, would have he just became that name synonymous with cheesy yeah. action and glorified sex and boobs and gangster stuff and mm-hmm. um it was a very different take on <laughs> um so yeah I you're right Dolomite was actually really I think he should have got an Oscar nom for that and it got overlooked no. like he was so good it, it was good and it just kind of had that message of just it was a subtle message it wasn't a don't, don't give up your dreams don't give up on your dreams it was yeah it's hard work and you're not going to make it if you don't make it for yourself um right. and i think that's a good lesson for a lot of people that are exploring anything whether it's writing or filmmaking or podcasting or twitch or anything no one's going to back you if you don't back yourself. If you don't put in the work, why should someone else come in and, you know, try to lift you up higher than you're willing to lift yourself up? And I think Mm -hmm. that kind of goes back to any, you know, social commentary and the climate of today is people want instant gratification. That's not how life fucking works. You Mm got to put it, you know, you got to put the time in. And I think the whole Dolomite thing, especially, um, and I can't even say black cinema because there was a lot, I feel like there was a lot more black cinema in the seventies and eighties to a degree, even comparably probably more than it was now. The money was there. In the nineties too. Yeah. And I think when people think of movies and it's just like, Oh, black film and black industry, black film and industry has been there since Sidney Portier and um, uh, Belafonte made their movies. I mean, they, yeah financed and they got you know they got that funding and they made movies so it was kind of like with Dolomite it was a different type of movie and he had to dig deep and make something out of nothing and it's kind of that that story that you know the little guy you know perseveres and pushes forward right yeah for real okay uh well that will do it for today Audrey uh Always so much fun spending time with you and talking shop. You like, too, because we could just you. like talk about movies like forever. But <laughs> we talked for an hour before we even recorded this. So to people at did. home <laughs> or in your ears. Um, so uh, before we go, let people know where they can keep up with you and the PopCon International Film Festival. Okay, well, I'm going to say it's hard to find me because people never spell my name right. But if you are so inclined to be up for the challenge, you can find me on um, Facebook, um, Facebook forward slash Audrey Lane, A-U-D-E-R-Y, Lane, L-A-N-E, um, and on Instagram at A-U-D-E-R-Y underscore X-C-X. And you can always find us um, on the PopCon Facebook page and at PopCon Film Fest 
on Instagram. I kind of feel like I'm everywhere and all at once, but, um, you know, follow us, like us. Oh, the PopCon YouTube page, check out the material there. Give us a like. Um, we are building that page and it's been a lot of fun. Um, there's some great stuff that's on there. Um, Brad and Michelle are doing these great videos, um, giving you everything you didn't know that you wanted to know. <laughs> about certain, you know, TV shows um, like Tom and Jerry and Saved by the Bell. Um, there's just, a, you know, we're getting the content built. So give us a like, check it out. Um, and some, someone, will, you know, on this podcast may have written some of those. But hey. Oh, touche. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Very <laughs> nice. Uh, so I should have been thanking you all this time. <laughs> and, and those are great. I love them. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Um, and we honestly... Cannot wait to see you all in July at PopCon in Indianapolis, Indiana, July 9th through 11th. So make sure you get your tickets and get ready to have some fun because it's going to rock. All right. Yeah. Look forward to it. And I am on Twitter and Instagram at brandon 4 kuhd the written work at whysoblue.com. There's more from the Brandon Peters Show this week. But until then, always remember to keep the positivity in your online film chatter. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.